Well, guys, I'm gonna get started because I am probably going to run a little long anyways, and so if any of you have to leave, I totally get it. But this is stuff that um, I'm fairly passionate about, and so I tend to go on a bit. Um, <clears throat> feel free to move the chairs to, to get up and, and walk around. Um, I know the chairs aren't particularly comfortable, so I will not be bothered by that. Also, I left you on your notes a large margin to the right if you want to take notes. And then finally, if you would like my version of the presentation when I'm done, leave me your email address and I'll make sure you get it. But I left you kind of the shorthand version of it. So starting now, I want, we need to define a few things. <clears throat> the first is what is a net zero home? So anybody here have an idea of what they think a net zero home is? Raise your hand. It's free. <laughs> kind of, kind of. That, that's close. Anybody else? Okay, a net zero home is a home that is designed to produce all the electricity that it uses. So over the course of a year, it has not paid for electricity, basically. You paid for it a few times, you've made some extra and sold it back to the grid. So a net zero home produces the same amount of energy it consumes on an annual basis. Uh, the next definition, and I may, I may say PV quite a bit, because saying photovoltaics is a mouthful. I just mean solar panels. PV is short for photovoltaics, which is solar panels. Uh, the next thing I'll, is HVAC. HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And then a couple other acronyms, um, and I apologize, but uh, ground source heat pump, we sometimes call that geothermal. In my notes, it's GSHP, and then air source heat pump, which when most people say heat pump, that's what they mean, ASHP. Uh, and then the final definition is ERV or HRV, energy or enthalpy recovery ventilator, heat recovery ventilator. Are you guys here for the presentation? Great, I've got some extra notes here. So uh, the ERV or HRV, I'm gonna use that interchangeably because which one you need is very specific to your home and your family. Uh, but this is, this is part of the HVAC system that uh, exhausts your stale air and brings in your fresh air. So any questions, please raise your hand at any point. Um, my overall strategy, is this my, yes, this is my notes. My overall strategy when building an, a net zero home, my particular approach is, is broader than just focusing on the energy. You could only focus on the energy, uh, but who wants an energy efficient home that's uncomfortable, um, that's a maintenance nightmare, and that's not healthy? You do, okay. Well, <laughs> Yeah. Is so you grid connect those or do you not grid? Good qu good question. Yeah, so off grid is something entirely different. We're gonna get to that right at the end. But yeah, typically a net zero home is is gonna be tied to the grid. Okay. So I will cover a little bit how that works and then how an off grid home is different when we get to the end of the presentation. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. Did you have your hand up? Nope. Okay. All right, so I'm more concerned, I'm not more concerned, I'm equally as concerned in building that zero home, I'm concerned that it's gonna last, that the materials aren't going to deteriorate. Um, I'm concerned that we don't create a petri dish and give areas for mold and bacteria to grow. So we're, we're doing more than just focusing on energy efficiency here. The first thing that um, I like to consider as most important is structural integrity. Um, so if I have to make a choice, and sometimes I do, between structural integrity and energy efficiency, structural integrity has to win. What good does it do again if, if a big windstorm is gonna blow the, 
the home down. So structural integrity will always take first place. Um, Josh, here's some notes. Uh, secondly, what's, what's next in importance, at least in my list, is health, health of the occupants. So we're gonna look at air quality. Uh, we're going, and, and air quality is, um, it's gonna consider mold growth, it's gonna consider bacteria and virus growth, it's gonna consider off-gassing of materials as well. Uh, that is going to require that we understand where the dew point is in the walls that we build and ceilings, make sure that we get the dew point out of there. Uh, it's going to mean that anywhere that can get wet can also dry, which if you're familiar with the black mold scare of homes built in the late 80s and early 90s, that's because we learned how to tighten the homes up, but we didn't learn how to make them dry out. So we were creating um, Petri dishes. Uh, the next thing I think is worth considering uh, in the line of importance, so we covered structural integrity, then health of the occupant. The next thing I believe is durability. Durability is pretty important too. One of the reasons a lot of people want to build a net zero home is because they want to build a sustainable home. Well, when we don't build a home that's durable with very long lasting materials, we don't have something to leave generations into the future. And so it has to be replaced. That's not very sustainable. Durability is really important. Also, a lot of the homes that we build are built for people who are um, getting close to retirement. They don't want to be up on the roof replacing shingles in 20 years. They don't want to be uh, pressure washing their decks every five years. All right, so durability is pretty important too. We look at material uh, quality there. And then we get into efficiency and comfort. Notice I didn't put beauty on the list. Beauty is incorporated throughout, but it's not one of the priorities. I won't say, no, your home's too ugly. I'm not building that. <laughs> um, but beauty is something that, that we also take seriously. But efficiency and comfort are, are they're interrelated concepts, but they are not the same. What we have learned is that when we focus on um, building something that's healthy and durable and comfortable, a byproduct of that is that it will be efficient. So to recap that section, energy efficiency is not the most important thing. When we focus on other things and get those right, energy efficiency is a natural result. All right, so you came to this because you're interested in what it, did it, or what it takes to build net zero. Uh, it's really only four steps. And so this is gonna sound really simple, but step one is an all electric home. Step two is reduce the loads, that is the energy use. Most of our discussion, by the way, will be focused on that part of it. Uh, step three is energy modeling. And by this, I mean forecasting what the energy usage of the home is with different um, insulations, different windows, and so on. Uh, different HVAC. And then the last one is add PV. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll kind of talk about energy modeling here and there throughout the presentation. Again, most of it's going to focus on the reducing the loads and then right at the end we'll talk about uh, adding the PV. So all electric. Why all electric? Any guesses? Because you work for the power company? Good guess. Is the, is the only okay, that is true too. That is not the reason, but that's, that's a good point. Okay, the reason is simply in a net zero home, the idea is that you don't have an energy bill. And if you have gas hook up to your house, you're gonna have an energy bill. You cannot put solar panels on your roof and create gas. <laughs> so that's the plain and simple reason. But there is another reason that uh, net zero homes should use electric, um, and that is air quality. These homes are, number one, tighter than uh, a traditional home. And when you're all electric, you don't have carbon monoxide being produced by anything in the home. And you also don't have to worry about gas leaks. 
So all electric for those two reasons. All right, then reducing the loads. Uh, so first I wanna focus on kind of the pre-construction part of reducing load. Uh, this would be the design of the home, selecting your building site, and kind of the planning process. So I think it's really important, it's not necessary, but really important to build a home that's passive solar. This home is passive solar design. Uh, so if you have a longer axis, you face that uh, to the south so that the sun is on that part of the home most of the day. This uh, the sun rises to the southeast, goes across the south, sets in the southwest. So what we're trying to do is get the sun into the home through these windows and in this case, heat the concrete floor. Now, uh, again, I mentioned that that's not necessary, but it's free heat. If you can use it, use it. Find a site that has a good southern exposure. Uh, we put awnings on here that are sized so that in the summer, they block the sun from coming in and don't create extra heat, but in the winter, they let that heat in. <clears throat> And typically what we like to do then is put the garage on the other end of the home so that it doesn't shade the home at all from using that, that solar energy. Another reason for putting the long axis that way is that I have more roof space facing the south to again be able to collect uh, solar energy from, with my PV. Another thing to look at with your site is the type of soil that it has. Now, West Michigan, almost everything is clay. There's not much you can do about it. But if you're looking at two different lots and one is sand and one is clay, sand is gonna be uh, the better bet for several reasons. Uh, one being that damp soils do wick away heat. Uh, this is a pretty well known thing. And if we don't take the right precautions, a damp soil can also add humidity to the home because that humidity gets conducted up through the concrete and released into the interior of the home. There are ways we can mitigate that, uh, but those are more costly. So sand is better. Uh, and then also look at what's your water table. A high water table means you're probably gonna have to do some special things uh, in order to be able to build in that site, which could end up costing more. So again, all else being equal, find a sandy site. <clears throat> Okay, next thing is, what about a basement? Do you want a basement? Do you not want a basement? Here, uh, we did not have a basement because it's a handicap accessible home. Everything important is on the main level. You don't wanna have to use steps to get somewhere. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. But the other is, if you have a basement, can you get the southern windows to be able to let that solar heat in, that passive solar heat? Um, it's really advantageous. So if you're, if you're thinking you want a home with a basement, try to find a lot that will allow you to do a walkout on the south side of it. <clears throat> um, limit exterior doors. I can't overstate the importance of this. The leakiest part of all homes is the doors. And yes, there are good doors made, but they're very expensive. So limit your exterior doors. That's the great and inexpensive way to get a higher performance house. Sounds crazy, but it's a real thing. Um, a common practice is in a situation like this home you'll see here, there's a breezeway which connects to the garage and also the outside. So technically there's only the one exterior door here. Um, as far as the building envelope is concerned. A breezeway would be con considered outside that building envelope. So that's one way to get to have more exterior doors, but improve the building envelope. <clears throat> uh, good doors are more, more expensive than a good wall, um, and especially French doors are not very airtight unless you really spend a lot of money. Um, couple of French doors we put in that are the, the, the normal grade, you can still see daylight between them at the top and at the bottom, no matter how many times you get the manufacturer out there. It's, it's a design feature, I guess, of them. <clears throat> okay, and then planning. 
keep in mind, there's, there's, you're always balancing th at least three things, any decision you make in your planning. Uh, you're bal balancing the design, the selections, and the budget. By design, I mean the physical size of your home, the shape of it, uh, what structural elements are required to build that shape. So that's the design. Selections are the things that go into your home, like what countertops am I gonna use, what's my flooring, um, and so on, HVAC system even. And then budget, obviously that one everybody understands. We're, we're pretty budget conscious people normally the cost of the home. You make a change to one, you're most likely going to affect the other two. So um, it, it's, it should go without saying that if you make a big home, it's going to cost more than a small home, all else being equal. Also, you affect the, um, the shape of the home. It's going to affect the structural elements that are required to build it, which is going to have a significant impact on the budget as well. So the, the three things are interrelated and understand that. There's always trade-offs when you, when you make a change somewhere else or one place it's gonna affect it somewhere else. <clears throat> so here's an example of how to apply this triangle, that I'm, the planning triangle. If your budget needs to be lowered, then either your design is going to change or your selections are going to change or maybe both. You can't just say, uh, cut some money out of this. Something's got to change. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, another one is <clears throat> if polished concrete floors are chosen as your selection, that's going to have an impact on the design of the home. It's going to have an impact on the, uh, the way that we order or sequence the job. It's going to impact, um, for instance, we won't put any interior walls in until after that floor polishing is all done. Floor polishing can't be done for a month after the floor is poured. So all these things snowball. <clears throat> it also, in this case, we have polished concrete floors up there. You, you, you'll notice if you tour the home, um, that requires larger footings. This is not a change you can just make later. You wanna plan on these things right away. <clears throat> so, most of us get to a point where our budget starts to squeeze. Uh, and if your budget, if, if your budget's starting to get squeezed, but your goal is net zero, I'm suggesting that you implement um, all the energy stuff now that's impossible to change later. You can change your countertops later. You can, in many cases, change your flooring later. You're not gonna change your windows later. You're certainly not gonna change to insulating concrete form walls later. And you're probably not going to add more ceiling insulation later, although in many cases you could. Um, so think about changing your selections, but not the energy efficiency features of the home. You can still get to net zero and then you can upgrade to some of the pretty items later. <clears throat> um, also in the planning part, here's where we begin to implement some energy modeling. <clears throat> so you're gonna, we're gonna look at the, the shape of the home, which at this point needs to be fixed. We're not gonna change it anymore. We're gonna look at the shape of the home, how many windows it has, how big they are. Um, roughly, where do we think our budget's gonna let us go in terms of how, how good of a window um, how much insulation in the ceiling, and then we run a projection. What's, what's my energy uses projected to be for this design? Oh, okay. Well, what if we change, make this change? What if we upgrade the windows? I know what that's going to cost. How much will that save me? Will that let me put in less solar panels? Maybe that will pay for the window upgrade, and I get more comfort out of it. So we'll use energy modeling quite a bit during this planning uh, stage to to balance competing desires between, is it, does it make more sense to add more photovoltaics or does it make more sense to upgrade my insulation or windows or what have you? <clears throat> okay, moving on in reducing our loads, we're still under the category of basically saving money. Um, the thermal enclosure, 
This would be a six-sided, you got your, your roof, your walls, your floors, walls, walls, six-sided thermal enclosure. It needs to be seen completely. And there's something uh, to consider called the pen test, which is you've got on your, your plans, you put your pen on the, uh, <clears throat> you put your pen on the air barrier at one point. You should be able to go draw all the way around the house without ever picking up that pen. There should be a continuous air barrier at every point. We're gonna do that for the air barrier. We're gonna do that for the thermal barrier, that is the insulation. So I should always have, when I transition from floor to wall, from wall to ceiling, from wall to window, I should have uninterrupted insulation. I should have uninterrupted air barrier. If I have to pick my pen up at any point, I've got a problem and I need to change my design you would be amazed how many plans fail the pen test. So the pen test is important. An air sealed home will not happen by accident. I can assure you of that. Nobody accidentally gets a tight house. When they're tight, it's because you have planned ahead of time. <clears throat> and uh, I mentioned air sealing first, I should have said this already, because it is the most important part of reducing your energy loads. It's the easiest way. And when you have an air sealed home, you accomplish uh, health, you accomplish comfort, and you accomplish energy efficiency all at once. Think about it this way. A really warm parka doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you hold it open. In the same way, you can have all the insulation in the world, but if the home is leaky, leaking air in and out, it doesn't do you a lot of good. So air sealing is mentioned first because it's first in importance. It makes more of a difference than how much insulation you have. <clears throat> so consider that your air barrier and your thermal barrier are separate things. You need to think about them separately and you need to plan them separately. You need to implement them separately. They are different things. There is one product that people will often use as both and that's spray foam. Um, that can work and it could not work. In a situation where it doesn't work for both is in a stud wall because it's interrupted by every single stud. It would work in a ceiling where I can spray over the joist and get a good thick layer of it over my ceiling joist. <clears throat> um, another thing to think about with air sealing is account for seasonal movement or drying shrinkage of the home. If you're building a wood home, it's going to shrink as it dries out. It's probably going to move a bit throughout the seasons. Is your air barrier going to be able to move with it? If it's spray foam, probably not. If it's caulk, maybe for 10 years. So we, we want an air barrier that's designed to move with the home or a home that's not designed to move like an ICF home. Um, secondly, we want to think about allowing for drying of trapped moisture. No matter how good your siding is, you will get water behind it. No matter how good your window flashing is, there will come a time where there's some kind of failure. You need to plan for the home to be able to dry to the inside as well as the outside both ways. So we don't use poly in our walls. Um, by poly, I mean sheets of plastic. That would prevent drying. That will create lots of problems. Uh, that's not the way to get an airtight home. <clears throat> Next, we gotta think about holes in the air barrier. Did you need? Um... Holes in the air barrier. So sometimes we have to have a, a penetration through because of say a steel beam. We have to penetrate our air barrier. Um, we got to plan for that. What's our, how are we going to air seal that? We might have to have something in place before that penetration is put in. Think of, uh, for instance, a plumbing spigot. In a typical home, what happens is the plumber comes in, uh, after the framing is done, drills this hole through the wall, puts his spigot in, and then the insulation happens on the inside. But there is no air sealing done around that spigot. What we have to do is uh, we have the hole through the wall ready for the plumber and then a gasket is put in place and then the siding block 
and then the spigot can be put in, inserted through the gasket. So you, you have to plan these things ahead of time. Your, your schedule is going to be a little bit different in order to make it all happen. <clears throat> um, windows and doors. Yes. When trades do penetrations like that, plumbers and electricians, whose responsibility is it to see all those things? Their responsibility? Good question. <laughs> We recommend that there be an air sealing specialist, somebody designated to it that's not part of any of those trades because he's going to have to be a jerk. Um, and you're going to have to be there, present, and maybe even do it with them uh, in order to get this right. It, it's taken, we've worked with some of the same trades for many years, and occasionally, um, Occasionally, we have to remind them of how to do it, but we worked with them many, many, many years. Just assume that they're thinking about how to get the electrical right and the plumbing right, not the air sealing right. So that has to be a completely separate person. Uh, in my case, I take that responsibility, not even the project manager. <clears throat> okay, windows and doors. Um, we're, we're again, we're on air sealing. Double hung windows are known to be leaky. Slide by windows are known to be leaky. Uh, single point latching doors, which is your normal door, are known to be leaky. Uh, at the front door here, we have a multi-point latching door, which when you pop the lever up, there are multiple points around the perimeter of it that grab and suck that thing tight. Uh, there are also even doors that we can get that have three layers of seals, um, whereas this one is still only one. So there's even higher levels that we can get. but this is why I'm saying it's a better strategy to limit the doors because a good door is expensive. <clears throat> All right, again, we're still on reducing the loads through the thermal barrier. And the next thing we need to consider is having a continuous insulation barrier. And by that, I mean no interruptions. So again, the pen test will identify this, but no interruptions in, in the uh, insulation. So a, if we have to have a stud wall for part of our home for whatever reason, we're going to need to put insulation on the outside of those studs. Otherwise, the insulation barrier is broken up by the studs and they leak far more energy. Think of it a lot like a sieve. A sieve or a colander is mostly metal, not holes. There's more metal than, than there is holes. But where does the water go? It goes to the holes. Heat flow does the same thing. It will just ignore the insulation and it will go right for the studs. So insulation needs to be continuous in order to be effective. <clears throat> uh, varying thicknesses of insulation. Believe it or not, the way heat flow works, you can't average out the insulation of a wall and think that's how it works. Or even the ceiling, if you're blowing in insulation and you have 12 inches over here and, and 25 inches over here, the heat is just gonna go right to that 12 inch area and more of it will leak out there. So you wanna have even amounts of insulation everywhere. <clears throat> um, huge numbers aren't needed here. We don't need R50 walls. We don't need R30 under the slab. Huge numbers are not needed. Consistency is needed. And again, Energy modeling will help us understand uh, what the right amounts to put in are. For instance, this home, uh, before, being, before we talk about the photovoltaics, this home is uh, at, at the current level is gonna use about $570 a year to heat. Well, one needs to ask the question, does it make sense to pay an extra $25,000 for geothermal when my bill is already only 570 a year and that will only get me 10% more efficient. So it'll save me $57 a year. How many years do I need to have that geothermal? So it doesn't make sense most of the time. Energy modeling will help us decide that. If I have a very big home and I wanna heat a pool and a barn and maybe even get some snow melt in the driveway, well at that point I, I'm almost certain geothermal is going to be the better buy. But where is that cutoff point? That's what energy modeling helps us figure out. Question. 
Yes, sir. Energy modeling, is that done by computer software programs? Good question. You, you just plug these numbers in and you get a report back from the software? Good question. Uh, <clears throat> I recommend that that be separate from the HVAC person. Uh, one, they're not terribly skilled in it, even though they do it and they think they are. Two, they kind of have a vested interest in using their products and materials and systems. So we recommend a third party energy rater for that. And yes, it's done by software. And I was initially skeptical, maybe you are, but after looking at some of the projections versus actual costs of our clients, they're pretty good. They're pretty good, you can trust them. Uh, you also, in order to do energy modeling properly, you of course are always doing comparisons. So you need to know the costs of the different comparisons. So it is a pretty intensive process. Next, let's talk about the foundation. I mentioned already uh, the, on, on sites that we want, if possible, a dry site. Keep the footings dry. If we have a wet site, we're gonna pour those footings on stone and that stone has gotta be drained to keep the footings dry. Um, keep your foundation walls warm. We've all been in basements that felt kind of damp and kind of cool, even though the temperature said it was fine. Um, that's because the basement walls themselves are cold and our bodies are radiating heat to the coldest surface in the room. Keep the basement walls warm, put the insulation on the outside of them, and then they won't condense moisture and they won't make you feel chilly. Um, lesson I learned, <coughs> <clears throat> early on was insulate the slab under the slab edge to edge used to be we would just put the insulation in between the footings and then the slab would be poured on top of the insulation but also on top of the footing well the uh, the first home I did on my own I did that way and the first winter the homeowner called me and said we got a major basement leak come here look at this there was water all along the wall for about 30 feet. Well, we, we went as far as getting a camera out and running it through the drain tile that went around the footings only to find out that there wasn't water in there and realized the problem was by, by not having the edge of that slab insulated, it was cold and it was condensing all the moisture out of the air. It was solved by, unfortunately, they have to run a dehumidifier during the winter. Uh, so we don't want to design that into a house. Lesson learned. <clears throat> insulation has to touch insulation. All right, above grade walls, <clears throat> keep the dew point outside of the walls. What do I mean by this? Maybe it's a good time to ask you guys, who can define a dew point for me? Very good, and that last part you said is, is important. You said it's the temperature at which the water and the air will condense onto a surface. When water condenses, it will always condense on a surface first. You'll get dew before you get fog. In a traditional wall that has no insulation on the outside of it, insulation in the middle and drywall on the inside, there will come a point at which the temperature outside is low enough that inside the wall, moisture will condense. We can, we can change this by putting insulation on the outside of the wall, and the more insulation we put on the outside of the wall, the further out the dew point moves. At some point, we can put so much insulation on the outside of the wall that there is no dew point inside the wall. But th there is ways of calculating where, where that dew point is gonna be and when. It's fine for 1% of the year to have some condensation in the wall, provided we built a wall that can dry out. But if I put all kinds of insulation on the outside and I use an insulation that doesn't move moisture, I might have a problem. I better put enough on the outside that I don't get any condensation or I better not do it at all. <clears throat> so keeping the dew point outside of the walls. Um, we, I mentioned comfort and I mentioned health Bit early on. 
For comfort, most people find somewhere around 45% relative humidity inside the home is the most comfortable level for them. Below that, you start to get itchy skin, you can get uh, runny noses, and viruses prefer below 30%. Above about 55, 60%, and it starts to feel uncomfortably clammy, you might get condensation on your windows, and you'll probably grow mold somewhere. So the sweet spot is really from about 35 to 55% in our homes. But if we have a stud wall, we have to lower that 10% or we're gonna get more, we're gonna get condensation in those walls. So by building the type of wall we do with insulating concrete forms, we can get our humidity levels at a, at a point where everybody's more comfortable with it and it's a healthier humidity level uh, without the risk of condensation. <clears throat> Last thing on uh, walls, I've covered this already, but eliminate thermal bypasses or bridges. Uh, that's an interruption to your insulation barrier. There are some home designs that just require structural elements to poke through the wall. For instance, a cantilevered second story deck. That would be a deck that hangs out and has no supports under it. That design is gonna have a major thermal bridge where the deck connects to the house. So hopefully in planning, we've eliminated all of those, but probably not. There's probably gonna be some that are remaining and let's think about them and get a plan to reduce the thermal bridging as much as possible. <clears throat> we could do an entire session on windows and I'm not going to. So just 0 0.20 is the magic number. We wanna be below 0 0.20 on our window U value. What do we prefer to do? I just mentioned what we prefer on windows. We prefer to use insulating concrete forms for our walls because they accomplish all of the objectives that I spoke of here in one easy solution. Uh, <clears throat> they pass the pen test for both the air barrier and the thermal barrier. They have continuous insulation. Uh, they're stronger than any other system. So we've got our structure there. They're very durable. Um, they make it easy to air seal a home because the continuous concrete is pretty good at that. And they have little to no seasonal movement. So uh, insulating concrete forms are one of those things that accomplish a lot of our objectives with one step. Uh, next, we're gonna have to look at the ceiling air barrier. Yes, sir. So in an ICF, you cord your wall on footing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are you speaking of the floor like this one or the next level floor? Subfloor? Yes. A subfloor? Okay, well in this case, uh, the walls are poured above the floor height. We fill in with, with the sand that we need and then layers of insulation are laid down and they touch the insulation of the wall and then the floor is poured inside it. So it's a floating floor in that sense. It's not structurally connected to the walls and it doesn't need to be. So this floor under doesn't support the material in the traditional house. Right, right. Yep, that's where I did that on my very first home. It happened to be for my parents. Um, you can kind of make some mistakes on your parents' house and they, <laughs> and they forgive you. Uh, that's where I learned that lesson with the water uh, in the winter. Yeah, yes sir. How thick is the insulation this particular home, this particular home, it's five inches. Five inches. Mm -hmm. And the composition of that insulation was? EPS. Okay. Okay, uh, so we were, we were talking about your ceiling air barrier. The ceiling is the one everybody forgets about, but the ceiling is actually the biggest leak um, after doors <clears throat> because warm air tends to rise. And so if there are any leaks in the ceiling, that's where all the warm air goes out. It will come in and be replaced with cold, dry air uh, down low. But if we can take care of it up high, that covers a lot of, um, that will take care of a lot of issues. 
People think their homes dry out because they turn the heat on and their furnace somehow dries the air. That's not what happens. Your homes dry out because the air inside is warm and moist and the air outside in the winter can't hold much moisture so it's very dry. They dry out because you're leaking air. You're leaking all your warm and moist air out your ceiling and you're bringing in cold and dry air at your rim joists or at your windows and doors. <clears throat> so paying attention to that ceiling air barrier will uh, accomplish again many of the goals that we have for the home. What's a ceiling air barrier look like? Well, in this particular home, it's 10 inches of open cell spray foam. But when we have a flat ceiling, uh, which is really ideal for a net zero home, we're gonna set the trusses, we're gonna put in a vapor permeable air barrier under the truss that's sealed to the walls, and then we're gonna build a chase under those trusses where all of our lights are so we don't ever penetrate the air barrier. Don't think your drywall is an air barrier, it's not. Uh, every light, every interior wall, every plumbing run is a leak through that air barrier. So the solution that we have eliminates all those holes. <clears throat> Next into reducing loads, I'm on, on item five here, your HVAC system. Uh, once we've kind of turned all the knobs and done all the adjustments we can on the thermal enclosure, the next one to think about is the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And I listed for you guys three different agencies that can help their independent and third party with this, designing your HVAC system and energy modeling. Um, highly recommend you work with them. They can, by proper modeling, uh, save you more money than they cost and give you the peace of mind knowing you have the best performing system you can get. We want to not skip the ventilation step. Why is that? I'll test the breeze. Not quite, but you're close. The occupants of a house need to breathe. So the air will get stale pretty quickly uh, if in a tight home, if we are not ventilating. Now, doesn't that seem to be counterintuitive? Why ventilate it? Why create a tight house if I just need to ventilate it? Why not make a leaky house? Well, the ventilation systems that we use actually don't use much energy because they're heat recovery ventilators. All your air that we pull out, the stale air, preheats the incoming stream. So the fresh air that we bring in is preheated or in the case of um, summer, it's, it's pre-cooled. The other, I'll get to you in just a sec. The other thing about using ventilation is we can bring the fresh air into the spots that we need it. We can exhaust stale air from the spots that we need it and we always have the proper amount. We're not getting too much on a windy day, not enough on a calm day. So by, by using, making the home tight and ventilating, we're guaranteeing the right amount of fresh air. Yes, sir. So back in your definitions, you described uh, ERVs and HRVs. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you describe the difference between those sure. and which one would be appropriate for the climate that we're in in the Grand Rapids? Okay. Thank you for the question. The difference is one of them is heat only, be, that it transfers between the two streams. The other one will do heat and humidity. Which one is right for you depends on how many people are living in your home, how big the home is, how many plants you have pets, are you gonna bring in moist firewood to dry? There are a lot of things that go into figuring out which one is right. So that's one I can't answer and that's where energy modeling comes in. Because it's not just energy modeling, it's humidity modeling. So if you're adding a lot of humidity to your house, that would maybe drive you to an ERV? H. HRV. Yep. Okay. Because the HRV will exhaust that humid air and bring in the dry outside air. Okay. So that's your tipping point right there, is how much humidity are you generating. Right, and we generate humidity just by breathing, showering, cooking, plants, pets, wood. There's probably more that I'm not thinking of. Uh, the next thing after ventilation is looking at a heat pump. I gave you a link to something called the cold climate heat pump list. There are heat pumps that stop working at about 35 degrees. There are heat pumps that stop working at about 15 degrees and there are heat pumps that stop working 
somewhere between five and 15 below zero, depending on which one you pick. The cold climate heat pump list will show you <laughs> which ones can work down to that cold and how efficient they are at that temperature. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of them out there that still have a coefficient of performance of two at 10 degrees below zero. And by coefficient of performance, that's, that's a COP. That means for every dollar of electricity we put into them, we get $2 out, basically. Um, <clears throat> we want our heat pump to be modulating. That means that it can slow down. So if we think of it like a car, um, a non-modulating heat pump is either full throttle or shut off. Uh, not a good way to drive, not an efficient way to drive, not a comfortable way to drive, and the same is true of our heat pumps. We want them to be able to slow down and speed up to match the exact load that we're putting on them. So a modulating heat pump does that. Uh, it tries to run a long, long, long time. Uh, for instance, the one in my home will probably run somewhere around 16 hours a day, but it uses less energy than a hair dryer to heat the home while it's running. It literally costs me a couple of bucks a day and it doesn't need to run long um, for a long season. It starts a month later than your neighbor, ends a month sooner than your neighbor. <clears throat> so modulating heat pump, um, you don't want to skip air conditioning. This is a common thought people have, which is well, I've got a really efficient home and um, I can handle a little bit of discomfort in the summer to save money on air conditioning. Don't skip the air conditioning. Anybody know why? It's more important in a net zero home that you not skip air conditioning than it is in a different type of home. It is humidity control. Yes, because of how tight the home is, it's going to have more humidity in it than your traditional home. So you need to get rid of that humidity. Yes, sir. Why, why wouldn't you use a dedicated dehumidifier and to remove the latent heat? Yep, good question. And then only use some other method to remove the sensible heat then. Okay, so m the really good heat pumps, like if you pull one of these off the cold climate heat pump list, they can scroll back so low that they're basically only dehumidifying. So you don't need that. If we were looking at building in the south, Atlanta, something like that, you would want to do dedicated dehumidification. Uh, but, but here we, we have heat pumps that are very capable of dehumidifying without offering much cooling. So basically they are the dehumidifier. Yep. But, without, but they don't reheat. Oh, you can, you can reheat, but it uses straight up electric energy for that, so you don't want to reheat. No. Nope. So don't skip the air conditioning. I, it, it will not save you money. It will make you uncomfortable. The next question people have is air source heat pump or ground source heat pump. I already mentioned something about the cost of the, the field, but I did want to talk about the coefficient of performance difference between the two. An air source heat pump is slightly less efficient, but let's look at how less efficient. Um, the best one that I could find, air source heat pump, had a COP of 5.01 at its peak drops down to about a COP of two at 10 below. Uh, so what that means is when it's 40, 50 degrees out, it's running at a COP of five. As the winter cools down, it's gonna lose some efficiency. As we know in Michigan, temperatures are up and down all the time outside. We don't have weeks and weeks and weeks of even single digits. Um, a ground source heat pump, the best one I could find, had a coefficient of performance of 5.35, so a little bit better. But the, the plus of that is it's not weather dependent. However, what does happen with many geothermal setups is that as the season progresses, the ground around that loop gets colder and colder, and so your performance actually degrades as the season goes on. My point being, Ground source heat pumps do have slightly better performance, but it's not markedly better in our climate. If we were building in northern Minnesota, it'd be a different story. But here we're at the, the north end of climate zone 5, even at the southern part of climate zone 6, heat pumps work fantastic. Air source heat pumps work fantastic. <clears throat> Force air or radiance. 
So this home is radiant heat uh, and forced air cooling. You'll notice, and I don't know how many of you are walking around without uh, boots on, here our floors are 72 degrees. Uh, what's, the, what's the interior temperature? 72. A radiant heated home, when it's, in, when it's built like this, that uses very little energy, the floors aren't gonna be toasty warm. They will be noticeably warm when it's really cold out, but they're not gonna be toasty. Also, uh, since we're insulating the floors, even without radiant, the floors aren't going to be cold. So if your only reason for wanting radiant heat was warm floors, you might not get warm floors. You're better off putting radiant heat in a really leaky house because then you need the floor to be warm to make up all, for all that heat that you're losing. If you get a warm floor in a home like this, you'll cook yourself out. So radiant heat is great. It is, um, it is a little bit more comfortable and is a little bit quieter than forced air, but it does not have the benefit that many people think of that they're going to get, which is really warm floors. <clears throat> um, another plus of Radiant though, is we can control each room separately. So if I wanted that room colder, I zone it separately, shut the door, and I can keep it probably a couple degrees colder. I'm not gonna be able to in a home, in a net zero home, have it 10 degrees colder because the home is just too efficient. It doesn't lose enough heat out of that room to get it that cold. Uh, but I can control a few degrees. So room by room control. Um, downsides to radiant are I don't have a way of cleaning the air because I'm not moving air to heat. I don't have a way of filtering it. In this particular home, we can turn on the just the fan only for the air conditioning system to do that, but something to, to think about. Um, and there are not a lot of options for all electric and radiant. We found a fantastic one here made by Space Pack. I highly recommend them, but there are not a lot of options. Just know that. And there aren't a lot of HVAC people familiar with how to do it. <clears throat> Forced air gives you very good air mixing uh, and very good air filtration. Downside to it is it needs space to run the ducts, which oftentimes can require building a bulkhead, um, which a bulkhead would be in your basement, part of the ceiling that's dropped down. Sometimes you'll see them above kitchen cabinets. There's a section of drywall. That's a bulkhead. It's to hide ducting. So that's a downside of forced air. A third thing, a third way of heating and cooling is called mini splits. And these are Ooh, these are technically an air source heat pump, but they run a refrigerant directly to a unit mounted, usually high on the wall in each room, and the fan is up there. So it's not central air blowing air through the ducts. Uh, a plus to this is they're, they're incredibly efficient. They have great COPs, uh, but they, many people would consider them to be unsightly or ugly. And when you get into a larger home, the cost will be greater than forced air. We've kind of found that at a point of having four head units, you're pretty close to the cost of a forced air home. You get more than that and you're likely to be more expensive. A uh, similar downside to Radiant, which is they're not really good at filtering the air. <clears throat> And then the final downside to a mini split is that you usually don't want to pay to put one in every single little room. And so that means you're going to have a little bit of temperature difference between the rooms. It's not significant in an ICF home, but it is still present. Does the mini split provide any humidity control? Yes, they do. absolutely do. They're very good at that. Yep. Good question. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna step on some toes here, uh, but we need to talk about wood burning fireplaces and wood stoves. And let me start by in full disclosure saying I do have a wood stove in my home and I would not get rid of it. So I understand why some people want this, but it's an extra hole in your enclosure. They're not very great at sealing. Um, what we have found is they can very quickly overheat your home. 
And when I build a fire, it's good for about two hours. And then after that, we're opening windows most of the time because it gets a little too warm. And we just light a fire once and we let it die out and it's good for 12 hours. Uh, so the idea that you're gonna have a rip roaring fire in your fireplace or wood stove and you're gonna keep that thing going, it's, that's probably not gonna happen. You're gonna overheat your home. So I would recommend you don't do these if you're thinking of that being your main heat source. It's for ambiance. That's where they really come in. You're okay with opening the window. You're okay with letting the fire die out. Um, the other thing is you gotta get makeup air for these. Now, modern fireplaces will have dedicated makeup air. A wood stove does not. So in order to get your wood stove lit, you gotta crack a window open, get that draft, get it warm, get it drafting, and then you can close your window. Because again, the homes are tight. So they don't naturally leak enough air to get a good draft going. Especially if your dryer is running. <clears throat> uh, then there's gas fireplaces, which we're talking about net zero homes. We want to get rid of a gas bill. Uh, gas fireplaces also can overheat a home, but the plus of them is you can turn them down. I'm not advocating for gas. I just want to cover the bases there. All right, next we want to talk about, again, reducing the loads, your appliances. I'll, I'll move a little quickly through this. Induction cooktops, they use less electricity than your normal electric, and they are extremely quick to respond. Um, in many cases, they can heat water faster than gas. So I know there's some gas diehards out there. Try induction. Um, <clears throat> oh, the other thing is gas, gas cooktops do overheat a kitchen, particularly one that's this sized. If you have a really open kitchen, that might not be an issue for you. If you have a closed off kitchen like this, your gas cooktop is gonna make it pretty uncomfortable pretty quickly. Um, range hood, this is a dilemma. Your range hood to exhaust all the odors, steam, gas from cooking. Do you do a range hood? Do you not do a range hood? That's a longer conversation, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll just very quickly say, they're great at getting out um, particulate matter and odors, but you gotta make up that air somewhere. Where is it gonna come from? Are you gonna open a window and just bring in that unfiltered and unconditioned air to replace it? Because they, use, they exhaust a lot of air. You're not gonna have natural leakage in the home for that. Uh, there is a piece of HVAC equipment made that will preheat that air, but that's pretty expensive. Um, then you could go to a recirculating range hood, but of course uh, they don't control the air quality very well. They have a carbon filter that can help with the odors, but they don't move a lot of air. They're not going to be as effective. Um, a third solution, which we've implemented here, is it has a separate HRV that we can hit in the kitchen to pull air out of the kitchen and replace that. Um, it's going to be somewhere between those other two options in its effectiveness and in its cost. But I guess the bottom line is there's always a trade-off here. And let's have a conversation about how you're going to cook, how often, and how much you're going to burn things. All right. Then, then your water heat. Um, after space heating... Water heating is the biggest energy user in most new homes. In a net zero home, it's flipped. Your water heat is your biggest for most families. So let's pay attention to how we're heating the water. Um, you'll notice in this home, we've used a heat pump water heater that uses um, the heat that's already in the house and transfer this, that into the water. And it heats for one third the cost or one third the electrical usage of a normal electric heater. So heat pump water here is the way to go. If you are a family like mine that has a lot of water usage. You do too. Yes, sir. If you had a air to water, which your space tank is here, mm -hmm. could you make a, a storage tank, a zone on your space Good flash tank? tank. And, and, and just put a heat exchanger in there and have it do your domestic hot water thing? That's technically, possible the one time that we tried to do it it has always given us headaches so we've just found it's easier to completely separate them 
But yeah, it's technically possible. What kind of problem is that? Lots. <laughs> uh, your, your heat pump water heater will cool off the room that it's placed in. This can be a real advantage. We, we had one homeowner where we ducted that, that cooled air into their pantry to keep that room cooler for storing their food longer. Um, so it can be used to your advantage. Um, don't use a heat pump dryer. We have tried these. The technology needs a lot of work. Don't be the guinea pig. So don't, don't do a heat pump dryer. That's something where the industry definitely needs to advance. Okay, we've reached the end of how to save energy in a home. And now we're going to talk about how to make up the energy that you're using. Photovoltaics. Uh, we don't use solar hot water anymore because the panels are inexpensive enough and efficient enough that it's not cost effective to do solar hot water anymore. I'm better off doing extra PV and a heat pump water heater. Um, the two basic options we have are going to be a ground mounted system or a roof mounted system. So what are the advantages of ground mounting? Anybody? <laughs> Amanda said you can clean them off. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Big advantage. Big advantage. Nothing will drive you crazier than staring at your panels on the roof covered with snow. I promise you. So that's an advantage of ground mount. Do you have another one? Yes. Yes. You can upgrade the mounting hardware. It's pretty expensive, but to tilt the angle as the uh, sun moves up or down in the sky during the seasons. So you can get a little bit more efficiency out of them. Disadvantage, anybody? What's that? Basketballs? Maybe, yeah. Okay, that's true. When we get them on the roof, we're up above um, a lot of trees. So we get better sun in some, this is site specific. What else? Yes. Space. That's a big one. Yep. What else? Uh, just a more expensive install. Yes. Cost. So good. Good job, guys. You got them all. Um, if you're going to roof mount them, the ideal roof pitch is somewhere around 712. It, of course, it changes summer to winter. 712 is a nice balance between the two seasons. Obviously, your roof needs to face south, which is where the sun is. And when you're specifying your trusses, Specify them for the extra load of the panels. <clears throat> okay, then how do you size them? Well, uh, in this particular home, again, we, we did our energy modeling. We ended up on what our spe specifications were going to be. And there was a projection that came with that of how many kilowatts, how many kilowatt hours of energy it was going to use. Take that to the solar provider. Ask them to give you a couple of different systems that will produce that much electricity in this location in Michigan. And they will give you, you, you can do lower efficient panels and more of them, higher efficient, less, and so on. Different brands, different availabilities. But they'll give you a couple of different options for systems, but you're sizing that system to match or slightly exceed that load. Um, what we have found is people who are very energy conscious tend to have their actual usage less than we project. So they can probably get away on the smaller side of photovoltaics. Um, if you've got a lot of kids, you're probably going to use more energy than we project because kids love to leave lights on so that their dads have something to do. Um, another strategy, if money is a little bit tight, you can size that system for a little bit less than you're projecting to use and see what your actual usage is for a year or two and then add how many more panels you need. Reality is though nobody does this because it's really nice to wrap the cost of your panels into your construction loan. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that when you produce extra electricity, the utility will only pay you back pennies on what they charge you nickels to get. So for instance, it's about 16 cents a kilowatt hour to purchase electricity from them and they'll give you somewhere around 6 cents per kilowatt hour. 
uh, for any extra you produce. So oversizing has that disadvantage. <clears throat> uh, and then that's where batteries come into play. Uh, batteries help you in a couple of different ways. One, uh, when you overproduce during the day, that will first go to charging the batteries. And then when the sun drops down, the first energy you use will be from the batteries. So you don't get penalized selling it back to the grid at a lower amount. You just save it and use it later. So batteries can help you in that way. They, um, they lower your bill because you're not selling back at a lower rate. Um, w another advantage of a battery system is that when the grid goes down in a power failure, you can continue to use electricity and your solar panels will continue to charge the battery. If you do not have batteries, when the grid goes down, you're done. They shut off the panels and disconnect it from the system so that the lineman repairing a mile away doesn't get shocked from your solar panels. Yes, sir. Are there batteries here? Yes. Where are they? In the garage. Oh. It's like anything. Yeah. <laughs> they don't take up much space. You're welcome to open the door and peek in there. Uh, <clears throat> no more space than that mechanical. Nope, so, nope. nope. Wasn't going to happen. <laughs> uh, batteries also, uh, well, with enough battery, you can be off grid because of the fact that sun will charge the battery. And even on a cloudy day, you do get some power output. This is something to consider when you're looking at different types of panels. What's their power output on a cloudy day? Uh, but enough battery and we can be truly off grid. Now we're still gonna keep probably a generator around to charge those batteries in an extreme circumstance, but since we can charge them as the day goes on, when, it's, when the sun's out, we can be off grid. Um, that's the extent of solar. There's not a whole lot to it. It's really about reducing your loads using energy modeling to find out, is it worth it to save, uh, to spend more on my solar or spend more on my insulation? And then putting in enough PV to make up that load. There's really not much to it. Four simple steps. Any questions? Yes, sir. You usually see the summer load or the winter load being larger that you need to size the panels for? Yeah, good question. The winter load is definitely the larger load and um, by a long shot. And your panels have less uh, solar on them, less time on them. So you'll definitely be buying from the grid in the winter and you'll be selling back to the grid in the summer. Yep. And so off grid, you're definitely gonna have a larger solar array because you're probably gonna size for the winter days, not size for the year. In a net zero home, we're just sizing for the year. Yes, sir. Any experience with wind turbines? Uh, one home only, and um, it's very sporadic, and you don't want to do it if you're in an association. Luckily for you, <laughs> you won't have that issue, but neighbors hate them. Neighbors hate them. They're noisy. Uh, there are some new kind of cool ones actually that are coming out. I'm actually looking at working at that with one of my clients mm -hmm. in a particular hill. So when it hits and it goes yep. up and they are not like your traditional, but just like the vertical column. shaft. Like the yeah. yeah. The nice thing about those is they, they don't need a lot of wind speed to run. Yeah. So yeah, I do have some experience with wind turbines. Um, that's part of the energy modeling calculation. And of course, the taller turbine you go, the more output you get out of it. Yes, sir. What about water? No, no experience with that. I like the idea, but I don't know how to do it. Yes, sir. Have you been um, reading about the Propstite solar films? No. I, what I can tell you about films is they've been tried a number of times and failed, but if there's something new out there, great. I'd like to see it. Okay. And uh, the, the purported advantages of them is they're, they're less costly and they can, they're semi-transparent so they can be stacked 
so you can get more solar density sure. in a given um, area. Okay. And they're kind of like maybe four or five years out on the cusp of having a breakthrough and not having to use silicon based uh, photovoltaics anymore. This is definitely an area, guys, that's advancing pretty rapidly and changes are happening a lot. Um, but you don't want to be the guinea pigs. I promise you, you don't want to be the first to use something. Um, we have done it too many times and been burned too many times to do that again. Don't be the guinea pig. Use something that's tried and true. If they come out, get them two years after they come out. <laughs> you know, talk to somebody else that was the guinea pig. MIT developed the technology and then they licensed it out to somebody that's developing it. I've been kind of watching it a little bit, and it looks like they're maybe four or five years they'll have something marketable that actually works. Very good. Also, Tesla is great at selling their solar shingles, but you can't get them here. So, sorry. <laughs> they look good, um, but you can't get them. All right. I think that wraps it up. Anything? Oh, Amanda. I just want to say one thing in particular. I helped Jake with the technology, and one of the things that I want to make sure that you guys know, too, in a house like this, when we talk about wire, we talk about infrastructure, just because you mentioned it on some of the things like charging a Tesla or things like that. In a home like this, also understand that your network is going to be really, really important because you have so much concrete and you have so many things that you're trying to get through. So if things like internet and all of that kind of things are important to you in your home, make sure that you're working with someone who understands how that's going to work properly with the concrete. So you don't want to basically build a concrete home and then nothing works. Um, for communication to the outside. That's true, and I'll add that to this, my notes so that next time I give this presentation yeah. that's on there. It's, it's very true. Um, your Wi-Fi signals do not go through concrete, and your cell signal is diminished inside these homes. Yeah, so yeah. you might need cell phone repeaters, um, and internet has a tendency to work better going down, so you always want to have the infrastructure up. And like this particular house, you have concrete on this floor, we also have concrete up on the top, so it was particularly important because if we were just having internet here, trying to get it up to those bedrooms, you're not going to get it up to go through those through that concrete floor. So those are just things important, and a lot of times people forget about their garages. They'll set up their garage to power up for a Tesla to be able to charge the battery. But what they don't realize is you have to be able to connect to the network with that Tesla to be able to take the downloads on it. So if your internet doesn't work out in your garage, you can charge it, but you can't update it. <laughs> so kind of keep those things in mind. Thank you all for attending. Um, I'll be available for any questions on the energy side. And Amanda is available for any questions on the technology side. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.